So, Tori, touring is a major part of your life, and um, this is your last show of a long tour, and I guess your last show for a while. What does that mean to you, and um, how does it feel? Well, um, <laughs> I guess um, one reason I do it so much is because there is a a place that I'm able to travel when I'm playing in this way. You know, when you're playing uh, in your room by yourself, the songs take me places, but it's different. It just, it just is. And um, a part of me knows that I won't be um, going to the same um, universes that I've been able to travel. I guess um, when I'm on stage, you know, you serve the music and you become sort of like this clay. So where do you find the space, Tori? Your mother, your businesswoman, a producer? Well, you know, I can get distracted like everybody else can, and that's when I, when I stumble. No different than those figure skaters. You know, I'm obsessed with figure skating. I mean, not really, but, you know, I mean, I don't, like, travel around and go to all the national meets or anything. <laughs> See that woman, that redhead? sitting there. No, I, I think that um, the focus is really important, but more than anything, there is something about being part of a tradition of musicians that when you grow up in it as an apprentice, you watch people that have gone before you and you learn and you understand that their life commitment, their life, is to the music. And you see the music as living beings. And I think the Native Americans see the land like this. And other tribal peoples really do see the land as alive. And I'm not talking about because it helps, you know, DNA and cell structure. I'm talking about in a different form. Um, and musicians that taught me how, just how they saw um, these living structures, they were galaxies. And I've approached them like that because of how I was taught. And I guess I was, it was, I was lucky that I was surrounded by such ideas people, um, visual artists too, who saw their, mm, I don't know, maybe their visions that would come to them as, they were really interpreters. And when musicians forget that they're interpreting something that exists already, yeah, it comes through our own language, and because I'm writing it and not you, I'm going to use different language than you would. But at the end of the day, really, the song is sovereign. The soul of it is independent. And when you realize that this soul from another space is coming to visit you, and yes, it's an ether form, and you have to put it in a form that people in this dimension can understand. It's a huge responsibility. And so really, I'm trying to kind of define this very complicated being to people. That's all my job is. I am not this complicated being. I am this person who I can hear her. And they come as light filaments. If we were gonna talk about how they look, um, but because I can't draw, 
I could never put it down in that form. So sound is my medium. So I have to put it down, the harmonics of it, and you know the geometry of what I see in the light. Um, and sometimes the blackness is very, very vast. Sometimes these structures are immense. They're the size of a river. And I stand and it's quite imposing. And I'll just sit and look at them for a while and then they can make themselves tiny, 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 tiny like this. They can do that. They, it's shape-shifting, as the Native Americans would say. But, I mean, I guess that's how the smart people say worlds were started. You know, with a tiny little atom and then it can become huge. And that's how the songs are. So they've always been like that, but I didn't know how in the beginning to um, define them. When did you realize that your music and you uh, on such a deep level were having such a profound effect for so many kids? Well, until I stopped um, running my own game, which I was doing for a while. I think in the beginning, when I say in the beginning, like 14, when I was really trying to take being a composer very seriously. I mean, I would compose for hours a day, and I knew that that was my path. I'd been playing since, by then, for almost 12 years, since I was two and a half. Um, but I didn't understand kind of the uh, um, the study that being a composer, what that meant, the discipline, and how you have to write so much sometimes to get so little that works. Um, and at that time, I do think that I was very committed to interpreting these sonic shapes. And then, the music business is a very different animal than being an apprentice musician or being part of a tradition of musicians. The music business is a world where, you know, you can make out with another woman on television, and that's the most important thing in the music world. Now, that's the music business. And one woman making out with another woman, you know, that can be very interesting and intriguing. But if that becomes the center of the music world, it just shows you where the music business is. It's not about music. So I didn't understand that at 14. I kind of thought, well, it's got the word music in it. So that would mean, no, it doesn't mean that at all. And it, it took me moving out to LA when I was 21 and really ditching the way that I was composing because I kept getting rejected for over seven years, my work. I had so many rejection letters. And by then I'd been playing um, for the parties, you know, and for the Congress people that would come in and the lobbyists and their rent boys and their call girls all over, you know, the inner loop of the Beltway. Um, and after doing that for so long, I realized that I had to compose. I couldn't be, you know, Sam in Casablanca forever. I mean, I, I did have that fantasy, and I kind of was Sam today in my house. I just relived it again. But I had to compose, so I went to L.A. And they kind of basically sort of said, if you don't fit into this slot or this slot, then you're going to stay in a piano bar for the rest of your life. So. I started to try and make myself fit into their shape. Um, and as that went down, you know, very well, <laughs> so well that um, it was a joke because you cannot become something that you're not. You just can't. That, that is not a um, slag off anybody. It's not what they're doing. Or Some people can do music that you just look and say, I believe that comes from them, and I believe it. 
then there are other people that go, this is a mask. They're wearing a mask, and if I peel it off, I know that they're going to look different than what they're giving me. And that's really where I was. I wasn't doing what was coming from here. And so when I finally made that commitment, that's when everything started to turn around. And I had big, big battles, huge battles ahead. But the music changed. And because of that, people's response felt like, well, whether you like what she's doing or not, that's what she does. Whereas before, I don't think it, I just didn't wear the clothing well. It just didn't feel right. So once I made that commitment, and I started writing Little Earthquakes, um, and the songs that were rejected for Little Earthquakes, which I play now, and are very much a part of the live show in my life. And, you know, I played Mary today, Upside Down. They were part of the original Little Earthquakes that were rejected because, of course, the powers that be wanted me to take all the pianos off the record and put um, guitars on. <laughs> what a thought. And, you know, I had to really um, play a game of chicken with them, huge, to keep it intact. And I had to do that many times. But once I made the commitment to stay true to the sonic shapes that were coming, they just looked at me and said, you be true to us and we will always be there for you. We will keep coming. It's like Fashion Week in Paris forever. For the next millennium, we're going to have Fashion Week, and these gals are coming. But you betray us, and you let them change us in a way that we don't agree to, then we stop. So, so tell me about Tosh and what she's drawn from this amazing experience of, of being out on the road with you. We might not know until 15, 20 years from now when she looks at me and says, you know, I'm seeing a shrink now, Mom, and you've made me crazy, <laughs> taking me all around the planet. But I also think that she, um, she does understand that um, music is the center of our life. It's we live it, and it's not as if it's a separate thing that we do. Music is something we wake up singing in the house, and yet she also knows that there's a lot of um, commitment. I mean, things run very quickly, sometimes a little too fast maybe for a two-and-a-half-year-old, almost three-year-old. But she's kept up. She's done better sometimes than some of the crew as far as being able to adjust. Um, and we make decisions around her, whereas in the years I was touring without her, God, I don't know what I did with my time. Sometimes I wonder, what was I doing? What did I do? And now, the day is planned, and I, I seem to get most of it done anyway. Chelsea makes sure I get most of it done. And um, you try and find time to be with her. Granted, it's not, it's not enough. She's really ready. It's bittersweet tonight. Tonight's got a bit of both happening inside because I'm, you know, I'm now leaving one of my favorite parts of music, which is, um, you know, there's no doing it again. Like in the studio, everything is improvisational in a way. It changes. It's a living thing, live performance. And to leave that behind for a while, you know, till 2005, this is 2003. It's 
I'm going to miss it. There, there's a place you go when you play like no other place I've ever been. Even with, even with a lover, which is a wonderful place, too, that you go together. This is different. This, for me, transcends that. Um, and to be this, um, like this little plug coming out of this teapot, and you feel this electrical current running through, it's like something that I, I don't experience when I'm just, you know, driving to ballet class. That's a different feeling. And maybe being a mom has made the music kind of come together in a way. I sort of think so, because by putting another person first, I think I also was able to put Scarlett first. And I think things have changed for me, just the way that I'm able to nurture something now. Um, so yeah, I don't think separating the mom and the musician, I, I can't really do that. I'm still a musician when I'm, when I'm changing pull-ups. And when I was changing nappies and diapers, you know, I was still a musician. And I'm still a mom when I go out and play. So I don't really think it's segregated. I think it is integrated. But I'm not gonna sing, you know, Starfucker just like my daddy at Playgroup. I mean, I'm not gonna sit there and walk in and do that. You have to kind of know that, and the girls know. They never intrude like that. The songs don't come when it's not the right time. They don't need to do that. It would be my need to make a point, to bring them out in the wrong way, if you see what I mean. What song are you going to open with tonight for this last show of your tour? Well, we begin every night with Wampum Prayer because I felt like we really needed the old Apache woman on Scarlet's Walk, the old Apache woman sings the song Wampum Prayer. And it's sort of her blessing or curse, however you take it, to the settlers who've come to America who have taken and taken and taken. Um, and so she bestows greed is the gift for the sons of the sons. Hear this prayer of the Wampum. This is the tie that will bind us. And we have the sage burning, and I, I felt like this tour needed to be a metaphorical fire, like a fire ceremony for the Native people. And because my mother's people are on the Eastern Cherokee tribal rolls, and they escaped the Trail of Tears and hid in the Smoky Mountains, um, and told the stories to me when I was little, they talked very much about ceremony and how essential it was to hold the space of sacredness. And then the music comes, the drums begin after the blessing. And I've been starting with fairy tale because we have a different fairy tale every night. And tonight I don't know exactly what the fairy tale means yet. I've chosen songs that we love to play these are some of our favorite ones to play. And it really came down to that. Um, I think these songs also are reflecting where things are in the world at this time, chronicling where we are as a little group of people traveling at this time. So, yeah, tonight is bittersweet, and yet, I mean, we've been out since November, and it is a privilege to play, as you and I have talked about, to be able to play this long, and that people will come. And there's a time, I think, that you have to kind of, you can't hold people hostage forever. You have to say, you know, there is an ending to every story. I was out front earlier, Tori, talking to your fans about the end of the tour. 
Now, after being on the road for more than a year, what, what will it be like for you to bring some normalcy back into your, into your daily life? It's funny because, you know, we, <laughs> when people ask me about touring and they say, well, when are you, you know, going to get back to your real life? And I said, this is my real life. And that's what sometimes is not understood. This side of it is kind of more, um, I don't know, regular for us than it is sitting back and taking a breath. So it's a little awkward for me leaving playing for people every night because I've been doing it for so long, for so many years, six nights a week since I was like 14. Well, then it was on weekends, but when I, I was 15, it was five nights a week, and then 16, it was six nights a week. So I'm 40 now, so it's very much a part of my week, you know, just plugging in and being this little sort of songs come and you play for people. And so when you don't do that, it is time to compose, and I do know that. And it's a very, very different discipline. It's about research, lots and lots of research, and it's very meticulous. And it's that chop wood, carry water thing. Well, I talked to Mark earlier, and he said you're starting tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, you know, we have we have quite a few commitments and that's again hooray and i think we we love it our to wake up and make music um in one of the rainiest coldest most lovely places in the world <laughs> it's a blessing but i guess it's funny you know lauren i if you would have asked me years ago what my life would have been like I would have been living on the side of a dairy farm and on one side and a chicken farm on the other and this state-of-the-art studio in the old barn I would have looked at you and said you're out of your mind I'm a city gal and that's I guess how love changes you and you start to need different things you just want different things as a person and as a creative force you need maybe a different mm, creative space in order to generate. Because if I put myself in a situation that I was when I was writing Little Earthquakes, I couldn't compose now because I don't feed off that. That flame doesn't warm me. But it did then and only that would then. <laughs> 